Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Chrissy Clay, and I'm from the Australian Institute of Health Innovation at Macquarie University. Thank you for joining us. We'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we are all attending today, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. We pay our respects to the elders, past, present, future, and emerging, and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their cultures and connections to the lands and waters. And our speakers today are coming to you from the Watamadigal land of the Darug Nation. So during our webinar today, uh, we will be taking questions at the end. So if you think of anything along the way, please put them into the Q&A and we'll address as many as we can then. So to start, I'd now like to hand you over to Professor Geoffrey Braithwaite, Founding Director of the Australian Institute of Health Innovation. Thank you, Chrissy, and welcome colleagues and welcome Professor Tor Engelbertson. Uh, so this is one of our webinar series, but I think we're in for a special treat because um, we're a long way from Norway here in Sydney, Australia, where many people have joined us at the webinar. And um, Tor, of course, is very close to Russia. He, he, he lives in Tromsø. That's like Tromsø with one of those slashes across the O. Um, and um, he's a very good friend of ours and he's gonna talk about 30 years of cross-border collaboration between him and people in his uh, part of the world in Northern Norway and, uh, and Russia. So um, the topic is extremely interesting and especially topical, given uh, geopolitical events recently. So Tor is a very good friend of ours. He's um, uh, been working with us for quite some time. Uh, in fact, he's got a paper with us that's been cited, I think, over 200 times, Tor, which is quite an achievement. Um, so Professor Ingebrigtsen is Professor of Clinical Neurosurgery in the Department of Clinical Medicine at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, Tromsø. He's also visiting professor in the Institute uh, with us. And he's got an extremely interesting background. He was a clinician and neurosurgeon, then became a chief executive officer. And I remember the first time I met Tor and on his business card, it had chief executive officer of UNN, University Hospital of Northern Norway. And that is the most northerly teaching hospital in the world. Uh, that's quite a set of credentials. So could you please join me in welcoming, warmly welcoming, Tor. Tor, welcome back to your institute because you are a visiting professor with us. And um, please, would you care to address us on this very interesting topic? Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Do you hear me? Yeah. So thank you for a very nice introduction. Uh, and it's uh, very good to be back here at Macquarie. I think it's... Uh, past more than five years since last time I was here, roughly. Um, the idea to, to talk about this Barents Health collaboration was kind of an emotional thing that came to me uh, uh, when we discussed my visit here now. And uh, I kind of regretted it a little bit afterwards because it's a quite emotional thing, uh, but realized that having suggested it, I, I had to go forward with it. So I'll start out with this image, which obviously is a 10 year younger version of myself to the left. And the guy to the right uh, is my good friend and colleague, Sergei Kashilnikov, um, who um, was back then and still is the chief executive uh, of the town hospital number one in Arkhangelsk. And when this picture was taken, he had had a few drinks and he had uh, loosened a little bit on his tie and started speaking English. Uh, and we had just realized that we both knew a lot about the war history on the Kola Peninsula in the, in the far north where the Germans and the Russians were fighting. And um, we kind of built a friendship on this common understanding of medicine and history. Um, I'll take you through so briefly through the local uh, history in the Barents region and then through the, uh, the health and research collaborations that we've had going on for the last 30 years. Um, I'm basing this presentation partly on um, uh, 
on a publication that came just last year. This is the popular scientific publication of the University of Tromsø, uh, which just published a special issue um, giving a summary of uh, the uh, collaboration between Tromsø and the Arkhangelsk region over the last 30 years. And I'd just like to, um, to cite what Sergei Emanulov, who is the head of the health committee of the Arkhangelsk Oblast Duma, uh, says when he summarizes this uh, co uh, collaboration in this publication. He said that we have established near and private contacts of inestimable importance. Many have developed into true friendships, which cannot be influenced by time, distances, or language barriers. And this was said just last autumn, and uh, sadly, it seems like a very uh, distant thing to say uh, in these days. So this is just to remind you about where we are. Tromsø is here at the top of Norway. Norway stretches over the, both Sweden and Finland in the north. And we have this short national border with Russia in the north. Uh, there's a major Russian city uh, very close to the border, Murmansk, where they've got all their nuclear uh, uh, submarines. And then there is the university city of Arkhangelsk, which is here at the bottom of the uh, uh, White Sea, just south of the Arctic Circle. If we look at this um, and zoom in a little bit, then we'll see that there also is the Norwegian border town of Kirkenes. This is the, the border, which is about 175 kilometers long um, between Norway and Russia. So the, the University Hospital of North Norway is affiliated with the Arctic University of Norway in the same town, Tromsø. Uh, it's a five hospital community health system with about 750 beds and half a million outpatients a year. I won't take you in detail through all these numbers, uh, but our hospital um, runs most secondary and tertiary health services, except from transplantations. Uh, we also operate an extensive air ambulance system with uh, two rotor wings and two fixed wing aircrafts and a number of boats about 6,000 employees and a budget of about 1 billion US dollars a year. Uh, so that's briefly about us. Um, this is the um, geographical definition of the Barents region. It's the three northernmost countries in Norway, uh, Sweden and Finland, and the uh, five oblasts of northwestern Russia. And the um, Euro Barents um, collaboration has its council and its administration based here in Kirkenes in Norway. The region is uh, named after the Dutch explorer Willem Barents, who uh, discovered both the Spitsbergen Islands and the Barents Sea, and who perished on the Russian uh, island of uh, Norway Assembly in 1597, a long time ago. Um, there has been a long-standing trade collaboration between Northern Norway and Russia. These are just uh, examples. It's called the Pomor trade. That's the word the Norwegians used for the Russians. This is our common harbor in 1896, loading wheat barrels going to Northern Norway. And this actually is the, the uh, sealing vessel of my wife's uh, granddad during uh, uh, during seal hunting in the White Sea on the Russian side in, in 1928. So just two very brief examples of a, uh, a close connection across the border running for centuries. You guys have actually also been up there. It's This is a, uh, a detour from, uh, from the main topic, uh, but when World War one was over and uh, and the revolution in Russia was a fact, then the, uh, the English decided to try to reverse it by attacking Russia from the north. Uh, and they included Anzacs in their force and landed in Murmansk and Arkhangelsk in, uh, in late 1918. Didn't go well. They were fighting for over the winter and were uh, um, were pushed back by the Red Army. The only thing they managed to do was actually to introduce malaria, unbelievably, as a uh, very short 
epidemic in our Congress in the summer of 1918. So then came World War II, and a uh, very important historical moment was the liberation of Kirkenes, the Norwegian border town in 1944, because that was done by the Red Army. Uh, on the left-hand side here, you see the ruins of the Norwegian hospital in Kirkenes. And on the right-hand side, Red Army soldiers um, leaving the Norwegian inhabitants coming out of the uh, iron mines in Kirkenes and telling them that they were safe. Um, and the Russians retreated to the, uh, to the Russian side of the previous border um, voluntarily which kind of established a good and, uh, and uh, uh, joint relation between Norway and, and Russia, a trustful relation for the years to come. Uh, despite that, you know, the border between East and West closed. This is my wife. Uh, when we visited the border region in 1988, uh, there was a roadside sign showing the way to the Soviet Union, but no way to get in there without a lot of formalities. Uh, so from 45 to 88, there were, there were no exchange across the border, almost no exchange. Then toward the end of the 1980s came the perestroika and the glasnost policy, as you know. Um, and the very first informal across-border contacts within health and research occurred quite randomly when our uh, professor in, um, in, in um, community medicine, Anders Forstahl, met a Russian uh, physiology professor, Chak Tatshev, from Akangelsk in 1989 during a cultural conference in Kirkenes. Forstall's wife happened to be uh, the head nurse of the uh, UNN, the hospital, uh, and they agreed on mutual uh, personal visits in 1980 and 1990, uh, which ended up with this locally initiated collaboration between the university hospitals and the university in Arkhangelsk and our university and university hospital. Um, by chance, this coincided with us moving into a brand new hospital in 1991 in Tromsø. And we had a lot of medical equipment left over in the old hospital. Um, and the collaboration started with shipping of 47 containers of leftovers from the old UNN to Alkangelsk uh, in the autumn of 1991. Um, they were in a very bad uh, economic situation by then, after the economic collapse of the Soviet Union. So we shipped, for example, 300 hospital beds, a number of operating tables, and a lot of dialysis, laboratory, and radiological and other medical equipment to help them that autumn. I remember it because I, I was a medical student and we participated in uh, packing up the containers to get all the stuff away. Um, then came the political agreement about uh, between Norwegian and uh, Russian authorities, signed under the name of the Kirkenes Agreement in 1993, just two years after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So this was signed locally in Kirkenes um, by the foreign ministers of Norway, Russia, and Finland, and they formally established this uh, Barents Euro-Arctic region collaboration with its administration in Kirkenes. Uh, and it was a broad collaboration across a number of uh, activities. And as you can see, health, education and research were just one of them. This is the uh, Norwegian uh, foreign minister back then, Torvald Stoltenberg, who it was the father of the present NATO General Secretary, Jens Stoltenberg, announcing the uh, treaty in Kirkenes in January 1993. So the Barents Health Collaboration was then formally established as a part of, um, of the broader collaboration initiative, which included counties and municipalities, hospital universities, and a number of different organizations. Um, they decided to organize it uh, within health 
between the local hospital in Kirkenes and the hospitals in Murmansk, just across the border, while we uh, uh, were encouraged to continue our uh, already existing collaboration with the university and the university hospitals in Arkhangelsk and Tromsø. It was organized through a number of formal agreements and mutual visits and student exchange and, and a number of specific projects. Uh, and the health department on a national level in Norway um, funded it quite generously and established an application-based uh, project funding. This is our first delegations of, uh, of leaders and politicians uh, visiting Alkanovsk in uh, 1992, and you recognize Lenin, uh, the, the Lenin statue in the background. Um, to our back then CEO's big surprise, the, the top pri priorities from the uh, health workers in Arkhangels uh, were to establish collaboration within cardiac surgery uh, and in vitro fertilization. Telemedicine was more expected since we knew they had huge distances just like us. Uh, and then there was a number of other um, areas of co collaboration. This is just a pick from a very long list. Emergency preparedness and responses, uh, nursing in general, and especially education of nurses. Uh, we also established a number of master and PhD programs, and collaboration on infectious diseases, especially tuberculosis, which was a very serious problem in the prisons and the psychiatric institutions in northwestern Russia back then. Hospital management, which I self became most involved with in my position as um, UNN CEO. Um, and I also picked stroke medicine and rehabilitation as an example, because that's a project which I've been personally involved in until very recently. And this is just an example of one of the many meetings. This is the former head of our board uh, under a conference in Arkhangelsk in 2011 when we signed some new formal collaboration agreements. Uh, this is Sergei Emanuelov, who was the head and still is the head of the health committee of the Arkhangelsk Oblast Duma to the right. Uh, they became good friends, uh, the politicians on both sides. Um, this is just to give you an example of Arkhangelsk. It's a beautiful city, um, a little bit less than a million uh, inhabitants, an old city with these uh, beautiful wooden houses and a modern city with typical Soviet era style buildings. Um, and the collaboration was not only professional, but also cultural. And for example, during one of our visits, we had the opportunity to visit the Solowetsky Monastery, which is on an island in the White Sea, an absolutely uh, impressive uh, uh, Middle Ages place to visit. Uh, used to be a Gulag camp during the uh, Stalin era, and is now a very active um, uh, monastery, again, within the Russian Orthodox Christianity. So just to run you through the uh, a few examples, cardiac surgery used to be very centralized in the Soviet area, was uh, in the western part of Russia, mainly done in, in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And as you see from, um, from these graphs, the uh, mortality from heart disease was very, very high in Russia and actually increasing toward the end of the modern 80s. So the colleagues in Arkhangelsk, they wanted us to help them establish cardiac surgery uh, at town hospital number one. And uh, our heart surgeons agreed to do that. Uh, and they started out with joint operations with me, which meant that the Russians came over uh, from Arkhangelsk and trained in Tromsø. Then uh, they went back together and started doing the first operations on adults in 1994. And a few years later, also pediatric uh, cardiac surgery. They did a lot of courses and conferences together, both for surgeons and nurses. And they also included a wider international co collaboration with the Royal Brompton Hospital in London. This is a famous heart surgeon from London operating with 
uh, our surgeons and the local surgeons in our country in 2007. Um, and as you see, um, this collaboration was very successful. Uh, it contributed to a sharp decline in the uh, mortality from cardiac disease in northwestern Russia. This was, of course, not only a result of the surgery, but also a result of a broad collaboration within preventive medicine, uh, um, preventing smoking and, uh, and the hypertension and uh, alcohol uh, use. Um, the anesthesiology professor Michael Kirov, he's at the bottom left of this picture. He was very central in uh, making this working and he's a good example of how the collaboration worked because he was in the very first group of young medical students from Arkhangelsk who visited Trumsa in 1993. Uh, then he went back and completed his training in, in Russia, came back to Tromsø and did his PhD in, uh, in Tromsø and, and then came back again to, um, to Arkhangelsk and has been leading the, uh, uh, the uh, cardiothoracic anesthesia department for many years since then. This led to a very um, uh, broad scientific collaboration, which has had an output of more than 20 PhD, de PhD degrees and 50 articles published in uh, international peer-reviewed uh, uh, journals. Um, this is just a couple of examples. It's uh, a bit outside my specialty, so I'm not going to go into detail, but the one at the bottom is quite interesting because it's one of the examples that we learned from them too. So you see, this is about on versus off pump myocardial revascularization. So because of their restrained resources, one of the things the Russians wanted to do was to do uh, um, coronary uh, bypass on a beating heart without a heart lung machine. And they, uh, they published uh, this and it was very successful and, uh, and the, uh, the technique was partially taken up by our, um, by our surgeons also in Norway and is still being done to some extent. The next major collaboration was within telemedicine. We have a WHO collaborating Center for Digital Health and Telemedicine at the UNN. It's now branded as the Norwegian Center for eHealth Research. Um, and uh, as I said, the Russians have enormous distances and very harsh clim climatic conditions in the north. Um, and, I, and the healthcare system is very much more centralized uh, than in Norway. So they felt that it would be very useful to use telemedicine to guide uh, diagnostics and treatments at their um, remote locations. So they established, for example, with Norwegian technology, a link between the central city of uh, Alkangersk and the city of Narianmar, which is up here, just um, uh, south of the island of Novaya Semlya. This is about two hours flight northeast from Alkhangersk. And then they also established a link between the city of Narianmar and the very remote um, uh, hospital on Novaya Semlya. Novaya Semlya is where they did their um, uh, atomic bomb tests in the uh, uh, in the 1970s uh, and there has also been a research collaboration about the the, the long-term consequences uh, when it comes to cancer as a result from that uh, one of the most recent projects that has been very successful has been the establishment of uh, thrombolysis for acute myocardial infarction in this region so that is done um, uh, with central analysis of the ECGs in Narianmar and then the, uh, um, the, the uh, physician assistants who are staffing the remote health stations in this huge region do the thrombolysis pre-hospital. And it's been published quite a lot about this collaboration as well. These are just some pictures to give you an impression of the uh, 
experiences when you travel in this region. It's from my last trip to Russia so far. This is flying into Narayan Mar. This is the hospital church in the center. Every Russian city has a uh, site um, in memory of World War II or the Great Patriotic War, as they call it. They use uh, double-decker planes. Uh, today, these are modern planes uh, constructed to fly very slow to be able to take off from uh, short runways. And they operate uh, things like this. I don't know the, the English name for it. Uh, to get across the very uh, the wide swamps uh, in this flat landscape during both summer and winter time. And the other surprise was that they wanted help with in vitro fertilization. Infertility was obviously a significant problem in the Soviet Union. Uh, we started doing it in 1985 at the UNN. Um, and this was one of the first specific uh, contracts that was signed between the UNN and the UIT and the Congress back in 1991. Um, there were some very significant challenges with the quality of the laboratory uh, facilities, which were slowly resolved. And this is the first girl who was uh, born in 2000 after a successful IVF in Akhangersk. Then we have had a very broad collaboration when it comes to emergency preparedness and response in this huge geographical region. We have been running uh, biannual rescue exercises called the Barrett Rescue Exercises. Uh, they have involved all the resources from civil society from both Russia, Sweden, Finland and Norway. And during the years when I was uh, was the CEO in Tromsø, it was a regular upcoming event to participate in uh, in coordinating the um, the emergency response to some training scenario happening somewhere in the Barents region. Uh, we have also had a very close collaboration with them during real life accidents. The most recent one, which I was. Uh, deeply involved in personally was a Russian helicopter crash uh, outside Barentsburg, the Russian mining society on the Norwegian Spitsbergen Islands uh, back in 2017. Uh, the UNN operates the small Norwegian hospital on this island and, uh, uh, and we were leading the rescue uh, operation after this Russian helicopter crash and had a road collaboration with Russian authorities uh, in the follow-up after the accident to sort everything out. Um, this is my final example. Uh, we have had a number of projects going on within stroke medicine and rehabilitation, collaboration between our rehabilitation unit and the UNN and the specialized rehabilitation hospital in uh, Alkhangelsk. They have a very much diversified hospital structure than we do, so they have um, separate hospitals for many functions. So rehabilitation has its own hospital. And the collaboration has been about uh, rehabilitation for patients with multiple sclerosis. Uh, I was a little bit personally involved in a project about head and spinal cord injuries and especially prevention of road traffic accidents on the main road between Alkangelsk and St. Petersburg, which involved a close co collaboration with, uh, uh, with our Institute of Community Medicine. And then during the last couple of years, we have um, been working specifically on optimization of pre-hospital logistics, uh, timing of thrombolysis and acute stroke medicine and rehabilitation. And you see, this is one uh, very recent, quite detailed contract between one of my colleagues who is a neurosurgeon and uh, a rehabilitation uh, advisor on UNN and their uh, colleagues on the Russian side signed just back in uh, 2020. And uh, now working as a neurosurgical consultant, I participated in meetings about how we could improve stroke care in uh, 
uh, in Arkhangelsk uh, as late as in uh, December last year. These are some other examples, just to give you an impression. This is the CEO, Andrei Beretsin, uh, on the uh, regional hospital in Arkhangelsk. Uh, back in 20 time, uh, we had the possibility to uh, visit their development project, a new surgical wing at the hospital. Uh, this was a little bit disappointing. They were building in a very old fashioned way with 50 centimeter thick, uh, stone walls uh, or, or concrete walls back then, no flexibility for the future. Um, this is the next uh, CEO at the same hospital in 2017. Um, and this is from uh, back then we had to fly in via St. Petersburg and we, we arrived in St. Petersburg just the day after the Chechen uh, terrorist attack on the St. Petersburg Metro. Uh, which was a sign that uh, something was changing in Russia, which we didn't really understand back then. So, to summarize, more than 20 organizations have been involved in the health and research collaboration. Uh, there has been hundreds of projects. I didn't manage to find a specific number, but in a 2006 report, 93 specific projects were listed. Uh, and in a 2010 report, 15 was ongoing. I guess there must have been at least two or 300 uh, projects altogether. Uh, more than 100 scientific publications in international peer re reviewed journals, and more than 20 PhD by Russian students at the UIT. I guess, I guess more than 50 altogether. Um, is, an, is an example I mentioned, a study of the concentration of plutonium in placentas from the Nenetsk uh, Autonomous District, where, uh, which is close to the uh, nuclear weapons test sites uh, on the Via Semria, published back in 1996. Um, this hasn't been only easy, there were challenges all the way. Um, during the financial crisis in Russia in the late 1990s, this was a very one-way uh, humanitarian collaboration. They had no money, we contributed with a lot of money and uh, professional experience. Uh, in hindsight, I'm not sure whether our people were um, um, enough, um, how do you say it? Uh, nuanced about this, the the um, the intention was an equal collaboration, but in practice it was more like one-way humanitarian aid, which might have been humiliating to the Russians in one or another way. I'm not sure. Um, there were problems with some topics. We were stressing gender equality, interprofessional collaboration without too much hier hierarchy. Uh, we were pushing mentoring instead of top-down uh, leadership, employee involvement, modern principles for change in uh, management, uh, uh, involving the employees much more than they were used to. Um, I'm not sure whether we managed to, um, to uh, present these Western values uh, sensibly enough. Um, we sometimes felt embarrassed by the Russians not, um, uh, not sticking to informal vocal agreements. They wanted everything to be written down in contracts and uh, uh, and sometimes uh, things that we thought had been agreed on uh, wasn't clear if it wasn't written down in a very detailed contract. Uh, then during the later part of this collaboration, during the most recent years, uh, decisions again became more and more centralized to Moscow and it became increasingly different to agree on things. And during my last visit to Arkhangelsk in 2017, we actually didn't manage to have a new collaboration contract signed uh, because our um, uh, leader in the 
at a regional level in Norway was hindered. He something came up and he couldn't travel, uh, and he tried to uh, make me sign in his place. Uh, but the Russians didn't want to accept that. When when the top leader didn't show up, then they didn't want to sign the contract. Uh, during most of the time, we had a direct flight between Tromsø and uh, and Arkhangelsk with this old Antonov airplane. Uh, that was cancelled uh, a couple of years ago because um, uh, because the uh, uh, the Norwegian authorities didn't want to uh, didn't consider it safe enough. That became a difficulty. And then this change happened. You see Sergei here in his office in 2011 pictures of historical buildings in the background. Then three years later, signing the, the head of our university, signing a contract in St. Petersburg in 2014. Uh, then Russian, uh, then Putin was on the wall in all meeting rooms. We didn't really notice the significance of this either, but it obviously was a, a change in the uh, mood of the collaboration. This is my last, uh, second last slide. It's from Shitkinas uh, in 2019, the 75th anniversary for the liberation when the Red Army liberated the Norwegian border town. This is our Prime Minister, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, and, uh, and our King. Uh, and even then, there was a celebration in good mood, and, uh, and, and we, the Norwegian King and Minister, as usually expressed their gratitude for, for the Russian liberation of, uh, of Northeastern Norway after the, the Second World War. This is my last slide. Uh, it's from Murmansk, the Russian border town, uh, just a few weeks ago. And what's going on here is that they are celebrating the uh, eighth anniversary for the annexation of Crimea. Uh, and um, and the war in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, as you will understand, all the collaboration has now stopped. We just cancelled uh, a meeting in the Stroke Project a couple of weeks ago because nobody on the, on the uh, Norwegian uh, side felt like attending. Uh, so it's a kind of sad end, uh, hopefully temporarily. Uh, to a very uh, to, to to a collaboration that we put a lot of energy into, and which I think has been very useful for the uh, the health and knowledge development on both sides of the border. Uh, so that's the end of my presentation. The sound is a little bit low from the computer I'm on, so please raise your uh, voices uh, if you have comments or questions. Thank you, Tor. That was fantastic. Um, it, it wasn't, I think you chose well, it wasn't the usual presentation of someone just talking about, you know, a particular study or condition, uh, but it, it sort of gave us a flavor for the partnership. Can I ask a question about that on behalf of the audience? So, you know, the Institute has maybe over a hundred contracts at any point in time, partnerships with people doing research. You've actually explained a program of research country to country, uh, you know, uh, so it struck me, you started to explore a little bit about the character of your Russian colleagues. I wonder if we can get some observations from you. Um, my understanding of Norwegians, and I've been to Norway a couple of times and worked with you a bit, you know, Norwegians, it's a high, Norway's a high income country. Um, Norwegian people are quite individualist and kind of pioneering, a bit like Australians think they are, um, more trusting um uh, so as a society um sort of tough previously vikings you know high levels of equity and caring e egalitarian country russia on the other hand i can't kind of it's a it's a middle income country it's not it's not rich per capita like uh, like norway um russians uh, uh, as i understand them have a big nature they're quite generous individuals they they endure a lot of hardships um, much more hierarchical, as you said, compared to the egalitarian Norwegian character, more collective. Um, they kind of have a motto, Russians, hope for the better, but be ready for the worst. And they're much less trust, trustful. They're much more on guard with relationships. 
So how did you make that work, given if you agree with those characterizations, there's a vast gulf between Norwegians and, um, and Russians, and they have vastly different health systems and resources for health systems. So it's a mystery to me how this worked so well. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether I've got enough personal experiences with the collaboration to give a really good answer to that question. Um, because my role in this was primarily as uh, from a, in the CEO position. Mm -hmm. um, and we, on both sides, we had a staff around us with international advisors who were preparing the meetings uh, and, um, and working closely together. So for me personally, I, um, I often uh, collaborated in very formal settings where things had been sorted out in advance and we, we were kind of signing up formal contracts. Uh, but the impression that I've got is that it was very important in single projects to establish good personal relations. And a wide range of people managed to do that. There have been in numerous visits uh, to each other's uh, private homes in Tromsø and Arkhangelsk, families have met and learned to know each other through this collaboration. Um, people have actually become friends and collaborated from that position. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have that very direct experience. So the closest uh, friendship that I came to was with Sergei, who I showed you pictures of. And I, I remember very specifically what broke, kind of broke the formal ice between him and myself. Um, I have read a lot about the war history on uh, the uh, Litsa front, which was uh, between the, the Russians and, and the Germans on the uh, Kola Peninsula. Uh, up north outside Murmansk. And I, I recognized that his surname was the same as one of the, uh, as the general uh, leading the struggle on the Russian side. And I asked whether this, uh, this general was, uh, uh, was in his family. And, and he very proudly told me that it was his granddad. <laughs> And so from that moment, when he realized that I had read about the war efforts of his granddad, then, 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 uh, then he started to talk English instead of using the interpreter. Uh, and we, we kind of felt a, a, a connection for, uh, for, our, for all the upcoming meetings. And I think that's a little bit the way it's happened in a lot of other relations. Uh, someone found common personal ground uh, and then the professional collaboration started to work. I think that's a very nice lesson for all of us about finding common ground with our partners, especially from time to time it's heavy going or you have to deal with the formalities of the relationship and that's a very nice um, message. Can I ask you as a senior professor for the less senior people, early career or mid-career researchers on the call, on the web webinar. It seems to me, you well, you showed some pictures of you having fun uh, with a glass of wine in your hand and uh, interacting culturally. So you've obviously worked hard to become a senior professor and you've been a clinician and a senior manager and a researcher but you also clearly enjoy traveling and cultural exchange. So it sounds like, sounds like you have some level of work-life balance. For less senior people who are earlier in their career, do you have to work hard at that in your own case? Or is it natural for you to have built in some work-life balance into doing all these very important jobs, but also having family time and time for cultural exchange? Well, that's, that, that's a different, that, that's a difficult question too. Um, 
I don't want to ask you easy questions, Tor. That would be uh, that would be too easy <laughs> for me to ask you easy questions. No, I, I, I'd say that. Well, um, I've been uh, I've been lucky having a wife who has uh, contributed uh, to the family more than myself. I guess I have to say that. Uh, on the other hand. She's been traveling a bit. She's been with me to Russia a couple of times and have enjoyed that very much. Uh, I think she has. Uh, we have um, we have had Russians uh, uh, visiting in our home, and think, I think she has enjoyed that as much as I have. Uh, also, as an example, she actually met with. She, she's a community nurse, and she met with colleagues during one of our trips to Arkhangelsk, and that actually uh, resulted in a professional collaboration between community nurses in Arkhangelsk and Tromsø. So she kind of stumbled into the uh, uh, to a collaboration in her own job uh, through my job. Um, uh, but yes, it's, it has taken a lot of time, but. I think also it's it has contributed. I mean, I've been talking a lot with my with our children about Russian culture and about these trips, and I think they have enjoyed it too without being able to participate. Um, so I think it's been worth the time it has taken. Um, I think that's my that's my that, that, that that's probably the best answer I can give. That's very good. There's a um, there's a question from Farah in the. Um, in the Q&A uh, about the language barrier. And the answer to that is that uh, we've had interpreters available all the time uh, uh, for two reasons. First, the Russians actually had, as I said, an, a staff for a, an office for international collaboration with employed interpreters. So they participated and they were three women who we all came to know very well and they, they work with this almost full time. And on the Norwegian side, we had a, um, a, a Russian immigrant who, uh, who is a researcher within telemedicine. Uh, and she has also uh, contributed uh, substantially by being an interpreter in much of this collaboration. Fantastic, thank you. Um, uh, keep the uh, keep the questions in Q and A coming. By the way, uh, those who are on the call, um, can I ask about opportunities for the institute? Uh, obviously, some of the things we do map to what you talked about. Uh, uh, we're not Russian experts, um, uh, but um, uh, we do telemedicine. You know, various management of the health system and how to improve it and reform stuff. Research into informatics, artificial intelligence, using big data safe systems of care research and creating a science of better change, implementation science for better evidence into practice. Those sort of things are some of the flagship things that we do across a whole lot of things that we do. Uh, we also more recently have focused on health economics and some of the cost benefit and economic aspects of care um, with the addition of a new center. So are there opportunities for us, uh, some of our people to maybe go to Norway or work with some of the people in, uh, in the work that you do or adjacent to you, and for that matter, for us to work um, collaboratively with Russian uh, people, given that at the moment that's not possible. Definitely. Um, we, 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 have, uh, we have exchange um, arrangements. Uh, our university is, uh, is open to collaboration within most of the uh, the fields you uh, you suggest, so that I guess that should be possible uh, across a broad range of, of possible uh, of projects. Um, so uh, yeah, I just say yes, that that's definitely possible. Let's have a further discussion then. We already have some connections with some other parts of uh, Norway as well, and I particularly have uh, part of my heart in Tromsø, having been there a couple of times and uh, worked with you. So it's a uh, it's a fantastic place to visit. Um, and, I know, and I know you have that collaboration with the uh, with, with the safety uh, researchers in Stavanger, where, which, which which have a good uh, a good reputation in Norway as well. Yeah, and I was on a call with them last night. In fact, so uh, um, it's, the only thing is Norway's on the wrong time zone. It isn't on Australian time uh, at all. So when you go back, maybe you could fix that. Norway's on the wrong time zone for Australia. 
it's <coughs> very inconvenient of you to uh, not be on our time zone. Um, Tor, there's another question come in, and I'm not quite sure, uh, a couple of questions come in, we might deal with those. Di White says, was general community engagement important in the collaborations, I guess, or was it more directly with the clinicians and the uh, policymakers? Um, I'm, I'm not completely sure I, I understand specifically what general community engagement means, but I, I guess it's about the broader collaboration on all the other fields uh, that I listed. And, and if, if, if that's the right understanding, I say definitely yes. Um, just as an example, within uh, general education, uh, there has been a long lasting collaboration between the secondary schools in Tromsø and Murmansk, implying that people have taken their, um, what you call it, probably high school degrees as uh, on exchange. So we, we've had for many, many years, like I guess around 10 Norwegians doing their say three year secondary education in Murmansk and the other way around with Russians. So there have been, um, there, there, there has been, uh, and, the, and these students may have been the children of, for example, medical researchers collaborating uh, within their fields. So there, there has been a broad collaboration within education, cultural exchange and so on, which has, uh, which has supported uh, the collaboration within health and research. So I, I hope that's an answer to that question. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. Um, okay, we're coming to a close. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out, we usually like to finish at about five minutes to the hour so people can get to their next meeting. Um, we're coming to a close. I just wonder if there's any final stuff in the chat. Just checking that. Okay, a couple of things I would say in closing. Firstly, Tor, thank you for a fantastic talk. It wasn't the usual talk but it was fantastic and intriguing. And so I think made us all think a lot about our own partnerships with different groups and people and, um, and the challenge of really working with diverse groups or people who are different from you and, and who um, maybe don't have the same mindset or values even that you do, but still making it work. And that's a nice lesson. The lesson that you drew out of that about finding some common ground is a very powerful one. So thank you for that. I'd just like to point out to the audience that um, there's a couple of things. One is um, there's a paper talk published five years ago with us when he was here that he led, which is about um, leadership and uh, informatics, the use of information systems, which has been cited hugely. I recommend that paper to anybody whose work uh, has a footprint in that area. And another paper that Tor's published recently in BMJ Leader, which is his own story of when he was a CEO coming into being a chief executive from being a, a very highly skilled neurosurgeon. And uh, some of the roller coaster uh, to, uh, challenges and, uh, and, and good things that happen during that journey. It is a fantastic read. I think it's on open access in BMJ Leader. So I heartily endorse that. It's only recently been published. And it's a great paper. It's really skillfully written and got lots of lessons for people who are doing research or leading various parts of their own university enterprise or health organization. So let's draw this to a close. Tor, thank you. It is always a pleasure when you visit us. And um, we hope you're going to stay here for a little while, then go and ha have some leave, see some of New South Wales and Australia. Um, and then maybe next year, come and join us for a bit of a longer period. We'd love to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience. Thank you for Chrissy and the organizers.